This is not a motherboard review. There we go. There we go. There we go. We're gonna do a build with AMD's new APUs. AMD's already spilled the beans on these, but I've got my hands on them, and we're gonna take them for a test drive, spin, thing. It's not a motherboard review. It's in a board chapeau. That's fine. <laughs> First up, we got the Ryzen 5 8600G. Well, the first in the unboxing, not the first we're going to take a look at in the video. It's glorious. And look at that. It has a bundled cooler. A very modest bundled, bundled cooler because all three of the CPUs that are launching today, the Ryzen 3, 5, and 7, are 65 watts. Oh, they changed the thermal paste application just a little bit. It's much thinner and lighter colored than it used to be. So with this one, you unscrew the mounts on your motherboard and you screw it in and just bloop, plops right down. That'll be fine. Also, you get some warranty information. You can record your serial number. There's a QR code thing that you can fill out and do. Fun, fun, exciting stuff. This, this is the eight core. This is the one that's got some legs. Look at that, it's got a nice flat. This isn't even like, the really nice cooler. I kind of figured this might be the Wraith. No, I read the press release. It wasn't really in there. I would have liked to have seen the Wraith Prism cooler because that is a cool AF cooler, but this cooler will get the job done. It's just a thicker version of the other one. Thick. And it is. I mean, that makes sense. And then your CPU is in the little box here. Now, I could be wrong, but I think that if you're going to go for the Ryzen 8700G, you're probably not gonna go for the $500 motherboard. I've got the B650 Pro RS from ASRock. And don't worry, we're gonna be taking a look at even less expensive motherboards. I've got the A620M Pro RS Wi-Fi. This is a motherboard we're gonna take a look at in another different video. But this motherboard, it's A620M. You haven't even heard of that chipset, have you? I mean, this is the craziest, cheapest motherboard ever. This will get the job done even with a 16 core, assuming that you get a BIOS update. When this launched, there were problems with the higher power draw CPUs. But ASRock got that lined out. It is not a high-end board, but it is a board that gets the job done. Now, that wasn't true on launch, but now it's fine. But this, this is a board that'll get the job done even with a 16 core. But the off-label thing that I'm gonna do here, I get our G-Skill Trident Z memory kit. This is the Neo RGB with the Expo uh, profile. This is DDR5 6400. I don't know if you can see this if it comes through in the camera, but a Pro RS motherboard, it's not got a lot of layers. Well, I mean, does it have enough layers? It might have enough layers, but it doesn't have a lot of layers. And we're gonna be trying to run it at 6400 with our APU. Madness. Now this is a higher end board. It is an eight layer PCB. It's in the Hemic Audio. It's got a front USB 3.2 Gen 2 by 2 20 gigabit. At the rear IO, they actually did give you a bunch of USB ports. Those are USB 2 ports. So that's just for peripheral connectivity and everything else, but it's not too bad. Ryzen 7000 series, AMD, AM5, B650, 14 plus two plus one power phase. Four DIMMs up to 6200 OC. It's still the case that if you're gonna run four DIMMs, it's a little bit more of a challenge for the platform. Four DIMMs is gonna run slower. We're gonna run two DIMMs at 6200, but hey, you can get 128 gigs in two DIMMs now. They have 64 gigabyte DIMM capacity. That's your path to 128 gigs, not four 32 gig DIMMs. It also has a Dragon two and a half gig LAN, so two and a half gigabit. We've also got our uh, ALC897 audio codec. It is a 7.1 channel implementation, however. So it's the entry level audio codec, but it is a 7.1 implementation. <laughs> You'll be using both the front and rear IO if you're using that for an analog connection though. As I was saying, installation couldn't be easier. Pop the screws out and take your little bracket off. The thermal paste is directly applied already. Apply directly to the, no, don't do that. Generally it makes sense to go corner to corner. So let's see until, until you've got all the screws started. There we go. And then you'll feel when the screw bottoms out. Do not use a power screwdriver. Cause you don't want to over torque it. Now my whole desk is an anti-static workstation. You want to do this somewhere that you're not gonna mar up your desk or your kitchen table, but also that is not gonna generate a lot of static electricity. Look at that beautiful Trident Z Neo RGB. This is 64 gigs, 32, 16 gigs high two, 32 gigs total capacity, which is plenty. 
Boom. Our chariot is ready to carry us home. Hey, it's the entire rest of the system. Let's get building. Eight cores and six cores. With an integrated graphics card, I mean, is that what we're talking about? Isn't that already a thing? Why would I be excited about this? You should be excited about this because it's a single piece of silicon. It's monolithic. 65 nanoseconds, 55 nanoseconds memory latency. 65 nanoseconds without even trying. 55 nanoseconds if you put in a little bit of work. From an, an AMD Zen 4 core? The clocks aren't awe aw inspiring, you know, with the 7700X doing 5 point something gigahertz, but in a nutshell, the things that I would be concerned about as a buyer are, okay, it's eight cores and it clocks pretty good and it's got built-in graphics. There's built-in graphics on a 7700X. Is it really that much better? Because the 7700X is going to clock a lot higher. And I'm looking at the pricing here and it's like, mm, and I'm looking at the cost of the AM5 platform and it's like, mm, okay, let's set that aside for now and come back to that in a second. Because it actually looks... In reality, it's much better than I expected it to be, but let's come back to that. Let's talk about 5000G series CPUs. It's kind of the same story with the 5000G series CPUs. We're pushing the envelope with built-in graphics, but it's still just built-in graphics. I mean, come on. Well, I mean, we didn't include the benchmarks for this, but it's like 60 to 70% faster than uh, Ryzen 5000. That is a huge uplift. And also Intel... Mm, it leaves Intel in the dust. It leaves Intel in the dust. Ah. But we'll talk more about that too. Okay, let's take a closer look at the benchmarks. First up, let's start with Night Raid because there's some stuff that we could talk about under ho the hood that's happening here with, with Night Raid. And we look at it. Why have I chosen these three things? Well, you've got your Expo profile for the memory. We're using G-Skill Trident Z 6400 with an Expo profile. It's designed for AMD. It's, it's the kit, but it's 6400. It's like, wait a minute, I thought 6,000 was the sweet spot. Well, it kind of is, but remember, this is monolithic die. The Infinity Fabric clock for my CPU, 2400. AMD is planning to default the Inf Infinity Fabric speed to 2400. As of today, right now, the BIOSes don't do that. That's a bug. I tripped over that bug, something you should be aware of. And this is weird because in an APU scenario, it might actually be good not to run the system at the fabled one-to-one -one ratio, which is sort of weird, right? Doesn't that make things actually worse for gaming? Well, it makes things better and worse for gaming, as we see with our Night Raid, because canned benchmarks usually accentuate the differences that you're going to experience way better than actual games. So that's why we start with Night Raid in this case. 3D Mark Night Raid Expo DDR5 F Clock 2400, 39,238 points. That's quite the spread from just enabling the DDR5 Expo profile on our 6400 kit from 35,000. So that should tell you something. And by the way, this is not the hand tuned 55 nanosecond promise land. This is just changing a couple of settings. This is going basically uh, easy mode on this configuration. You can do above 40,000 if you're willing to put in a little bit more work tuning and you've got just the right kit of memory. If we look at the breakdown between the six and the eight core, as well as the aforementioned 7700X, this is where things sort of start to differentiate between 7700X with its built-in graphics and what you get from a true APU. 32,000 to 28,000 between our six core and our eight core Ryzen G series CPU, but only 11,000 from the built-in graphics on the 7700X. Yes, the built-in graphics on the 7700X is really only meant for basic things, basic encoding and very, very basic functions. It's not meant for anything complicated at all, and this shows that. So you'd expect that to follow suit diving into gaming, right? Yes, and these results are much more impressive than I expected they would be. For Borderlands 3 and Shadow of the Tomb Raider, yes, absolutely ancient titles. Don't worry about that. We'll get to that in a second. We're looking pretty good here, 1080p at low graphic settings. Our six and eight core CPUs are holding their own with a comfortably above 60 FPS. And this is even before we get into anything like HyperRX or fluid motion frames or anything like that. Generally, I think those technologies are better served on non-APUs, but if you want a game at 720p, I'm thinking like Steam Deck, for example, a Steam Deck based around these APUs could be something to behold. That may be something to think about for the future. But generally for desktop experience, I'm looking at this and I'm saying, well, Borderlands 3 and Tomb Raider are basically unplayable on the 7700X, but it's an actually not entirely unreasonable experience when we're talking about an APU. 
and this is the, the the debate that I get in my head is like, can I just suffer with a 7700X, which has better single core performance and presumably better multi core performance, and then just get a GPU at some point later, get a discrete GPU? No one wants to game on a built-in graphics card unless there are other extenuating circumstances or a built-in graphics facility. Like, no one wants to do that. And yet, this is not terrible. But keep in mind, even though these are reasonable, you know, playable rates, this is 1080p low. There's no graphics here because if you're using the system memory to store textures and everything else like that, even at 55 nanoseconds, you're going to suffer. It's... 1080p low, medium low, maybe, if you do the 55 second nanosecond tuning to make the system memory as fast as possible. But generally, it's not a fabulous experience compared to what we've gotten used to with discrete GPUs. Or maybe it's because I'm living in a world where even an inexpensive GPU in the $150 range can do uh, a nice 1080p experience way above 60 FPS, even above this. But still, for built-in graphics, this is pretty good. So I, I'm, I'm kind of... I'm of two minds here. It's it's interesting. What about an esports title like Fortnite? Well, 1080p low, Fortnite is an even better experience than these older titles because it's optimized six ways to Sunday. What about more modern games like Cyberpunk 2077 and Far Cry 6? Okay, that's good. I took a look at a lot of games, but I wanted to show you these specific benchmarks to sort of capture my experience here. 40 FPS is okay if you're in free sync range. Like, it's playable. The single thread, the compute performance of these CPUs is good enough that the game itself doesn't really hitch or stutter or whatever. It is definitely uh, the suboptimal experience from the graphics standpoint as opposed to stuff actually happening in game. It would be nice to see better performance here at 1080p low, and you can turn even more stuff off in Cyberpunk, but this is probably what I would actually play at just because I have FreeSync. Same kind of a story with Far Cry 6. You can enjoy Far Cry 6, have a lot of fun with the story, and it doesn't <laughs> it doesn't frame up too bad except for explosions and some of the other stuff. So, uh, okay. You can also see that uh, there's 7700X, basically a trash fire experience for gaming. I mean, it's got graphics, but it you know, ain't happening. Also included some 8 64 benchmarks with F-Clock 2400 and the Expo Profile, and then uh, F-Clock 2000 and the Expo Profile. I decided to turn PBO on with just turning PBO on and setting the Expo profile and setting the F-Clock to 2400. That was enough to get our latency to 66 nanoseconds. With just F-Clock 2400 and Expo, it's 79 nanoseconds, give or take. And then just the Expo profile by itself is the only thing I changed from the BIOS default, 83 nanoseconds. This is not a great showing here and almost certainly the non-launch day BIOSes will be better. But this is also a little bit of a cautionary tale to AMD. Look, AMD is becoming the dominant incumbent power here. They really are leading generation over generation. This is not a game of, of, of leapfrog. AMD's leading. And when AMD is leading, mm, the bugs are more annoying. So when AMD's the plucky little underdog, it's like, oh, yeah, we, oh, okay, we got to update the BIOS. When you're selling hundreds of millions of units, it's a little bit more problematic. If you have a 0.01% failure in a million units versus a hundred million units, that is a way different customer service experience inside your company in terms of personnel and people that you have to deal with. And AMD has the intelligence and the personnel and the right mindset to figure out more automation and more stuff to do this. And gosh darn it, it does look like they are getting off their tail and doing that. But they got to do more sooner. And especially with drivers, and especially with the APU, and especially with everything else. Because 24.1.1, the adrenaline drivers, added a lot of functionality. But it literally dropped the day before this video. The timing was not super great. And I am seeing some performance differences in actual games, for the better, with 24.1.1, than I am other games. Fluid motion frames and everything else like that. So like the version of Cyberpunk 2077 that I have is the good old games version, which seems to behave differently with fluid motion frames than the Steam version. Maybe, or maybe not, or maybe it's just because I didn't do a DDU fresh install of 24.1.1. I'm still chasing that down. Honestly, I don't know, but I run a large enough user forum and, you know, sort of troubleshoot vicariously that way that enough interesting weird stuff has happened that more love is needed in this department. And so, it's not fabulous that I'm telling users, hey, by the way, double check your BIOS. There's going to be a BIOS update. F-Clock 2400 should be by default. Because F-Clock 2000 on the Zen 4 stuff, that has to stay. But 2400 F-Clock 
on the APUs does help the APUs a lot. And the BIOS has to be smart enough to say, okay, in, in this scenario, my default is this. In this other scenario, my default is that. Cool beans. Oh, and while we're talking about performance and everything else here and, you know, AMD leading in terms of engineering, I hear you screaming Intel. Intel's 13th, 12th, 13th, 14th generation built-in GPU really isn't any better than the GPU that's built into the 7700X. AMD is light years ahead. I think that more fair comparison is probably going to be one of Intel's mobile solutions. Maybe something in Meteor Lake, maybe Arc. I don't know. I don't have any Meteor Lake laptops yet. It's on the to-do list. Haven't had time yet. We've been expanding. Thank you to the Level 1 community and all of the, the stuff. We are really ramping up to do some really amazing things because of support from our community. I'm not quite there yet, but we'll get there in 2024, probably, maybe into 2025. Got some big plans. But Meteor Lake and Mobile XE Graphics and, and XECS, XESS, Intel is getting their ducks in a row to do some really amazing stuff here. But they're where AMD was like five or six years ago. The difference is that their programming teams and their software people are basically already in place. AMD's got a little bit of a, a hardware advantage at this point and uh, a lot of a software advantage in terms of experience. But Intel's software people are very smart and will catch up quickly if they have the right executive leadership. I think AMD's got the right executive leadership, but and they've definitely got the right people in the trenches, but sometimes it does seem like something is or was missing when we're talking about the graphics stack. I don't know. That's just me rambling. I, I wouldn't take, I wouldn't read too much into that. But from an engineering perspective, AMD is leading here and they have to sort of get in that leadership mindset instead of the plucky little, ah, let's just, you know, reboot this, do that. I mean, that's cool. They can do that with beta versions, label it beta, but not when, you know, this is the de facto standard. Like, you, get it? you see what I'm saying? So what about CPU compute? This is where things get interesting again. A single core Cinebench score over a thousand. I could score as high as a thousand eighty with PBO and tuning and everything else, but a thousand twenty five for just turning on a couple of things in BIOS and having the system be perfectly stable. That is a tremendously good result from our eight core. The spread here with our eight core is pretty substantial though between just enabling Expo and then Expo plus F clock twenty four hundred and then PBO and everything else. Mm, okay. It's just something to keep in mind, that the performance variance is potentially that much unless you're willing to dial it in. Now Cinebench for the 7700X multi-core, I would have expected the 7700X to absolutely dominate, but that's not the case here. Cinebench likes running from cache and it likes lots of cores, but it turns out that when the 7700X is fully loaded, the 7700X core advantages kind of go away. This makes sense if you think about it. The 7700X can use most of its power budget to get that 5 gigahertz plus boost that you're just never going to see on the, the, the plucky little low power Zen 4C-ish cores that are in the APU. It just can't boost that high. It's never going to need that much power. So the 7700X advantage is almost entirely, it's like 80% its advantage is in that single core boost. It's got maybe a 20% advantage in multi-core. Core for core, a fully loaded CPU uh, doesn't have the power budget, even though the 7700X power budget is higher, to really give you the edge in multi-core. That is fascinating. That's a fascinating result. I would not have expected that, but there we are. And the 6-core, of course, holds its own with its six plucky little cores. Similarly, the breakdown with Geekbench is kind of a similar story. If you dig into the actual results in Geekbench, you'll see the 8700G does better than the 7700X in some areas, but the 7700X pulls ahead in others. Generally, the 7700X is ahead of the 8700G, core for core, in Geekbench, even though this is the CPU Geekbench test, which mostly doesn't focus on the GPU, but certain things could be accelerated by some of the GPU-adjacent stuff that's you know, the machinery that's in the CPU, I guess. And some things maybe benefit from the fact that it's not a chiplet, and some things benefit from the lower memory latency. So, uh, it's almost a wash, but the edge does go to the 7700X in Geekbench. And of course, the 6-core holds its own. PC Mark 10 added an APU benchmark, and here is where the 86 and 8700G pull ahead of the 7700X. Not entirely unexpected since this test relies on tests that are done on the GPU portion of the CPU. 
Also ran a V-Ray benchmark because that Cinebench result was bothering me a little bit. I really was expecting the 7700X multi-core to be better than it was, but it's not. It's just not. And V-Ray sort of bar- bears that out again. It's like the, the scores between V-Ray are close enough here that for multi-core, I would almost call this a wash. I mean, again, it's in favor of the 7700X, but that if you power limited the 7700X, then it's probably going to be about the same, if not a little bit worse. And that's interesting from, you know, chiplet versus non-chiplet lower core versus higher core it really suggests that the difference between the 7700x and the 8700g is really down to those single and lightly threaded boost workloads stellaris is maybe also worth a special mention because it's a little anomalous in the pre-release driver the six core was kind of consistently outperforming the eight core now this isn't something super unusual we've encountered this before when we've reviewed the mini pcs on like from minis forum and sometimes it has to do with power budget allocation. Like how much power do you want to give the CPU? How much power do you want to give the GPU? Does the driver do a good job balancing that? Do you want to manually specify that? What do you want to do with that? And on these desktop parts, maybe that carries over, maybe not. So Stellaris, I sort of set to the side. Fortunately, the driver update that I was mentioning, 24.1.1, seems to improve the situation. It, it brought up the performance of the 8-core, but possibly brought down the performance of the 6-core just a little bit. The, the testing that we're doing, like Stellaris doesn't have a built-in benchmark. So what I like to do is play in-game scenarios, because that's usually when the uh, game gets a little chunky. And my in-game scenario is very messy. A lot of planets, a lot of rioting, a lot of large fleets of ships. And the real-world gameplay experience is that the frame rate is pretty inconsistent. On the pre-driver, I was going to say that, you know, maybe not the best Stellaris experience. But with the 24.1.1 update, it is playable, although the frame rate does bounce between 30 and 60 FPS. Zooming in, moving around the map, responding to something definitely doesn't feel as fluid as it does with the uh, a dedicated GPU. But... The performance between the 6-core and the 8-core, at least with 24.1.1, is more consistent. So there were a couple of times where the 6-core pulled ahead of the 8-core still, but that was happening less, and the performance on the 8-core was generally a little higher with the newer driver. So hopefully the trend continues. Yay, Stellaris! It's also true that Stellaris is one of those games that I've played enough to know, like, mm, something ain't going, <laughs> ain't going right under, uh, under the covers. And something was definitely not right with the earlier drivers in Stellaris. Stellaris feels a lot better now with the newer driver, even though we still see the, uh, frame, <laughs> frame rate dip to 30 FPS and the, the, uh, you know, it struggles to keep up sometimes, even at 1080p low. But it was a reasonable gameplay experience. I would actually play Stellaris on an APU that performs this well. And it actually makes me want to go back and revisit Stellaris on some of like our minis forum minis PCs that have the 780M because I really was not super enthused with the gaming performance in the small form factor scenario then. Yay, driver improvements. So yeah, bottom line, these are actually pretty good CPUs. The AM5 ecosystem driving adoption of lower cost boards, the fact these are 65 watt CPUs, there's there's a lot to like here in terms of APU launch. In my mind, I keep going back to, would I buy one of these instead of getting a discrete GPU? And the answer is always no. But that might not be the case for some people. You might be perfectly happy playing Stellaris at 1080p at a reasonable, you know, 40 to 60 per, you know, uh, FPS frame rate when you get in the end game scenario. You might be okay w- with Fortnite on low. You might be okay with, you know, just enjoying the occasional light game. This is going to enable a lot of small ish form factor machines. We've covered a lot of mini PCs in the past, stuff from Minis Forum, where it's the mobile CPUs from AMD, which have the same graphics horsepower that is in the uh, Ryzen 8000G series CPUs, meaning that like they've they've repackaged what you have for a GPU, but for desktop with desktop cores. The biggest advantage in the desktop versus mini PC is that you can slam 6400 and beyond a DDR5 in it. These APUs will probably tremendously benefit from 7000, 7400, 8000, and beyond DDR5 memory when we figure that out from both a uh, motherboard and software support standpoint. On desktop boards that have four memory channels, it is possible now to run DDR5-6000, but it's still really tricky to do with the chiplet-based CPUs. I intend to test four DIMM configurations 
with the APUs, but I'm not holding my breath. I'm not expecting that to be good, but stay tuned for that video that, that's coming up next. Because it's like, what sense does it make to run 128 gigs with an APU? Well, if you only need eight compute cores and under full load, it's basically the same as a 7700X. Why not? Might make a pretty good development machine for doing some, you know, light gaming stuff. And if we look at Fortnite, Fortnite, they obviously put a ton of, you know, Epic put a ton of optimization into Fortnite to get it to run on the the, <laughs> the Intel iGPUs of the world and also the 7700X you know, GPUs of the world because that, that GPU is not much. To get Fortnite to run as well as it does before the Zen 4 APUs. And the Zen 4 APUs run Fortnite shockingly well at low settings. Much better than I ever expected. We really are in an era where an APU can give you 1080p gaming at 60 FPS with what is today considered low quality textures. That's a milestone. It's a watershed moment. It's just that discrete GPUs are so amazing now that it kind of overshadows that. So it really is an engineering win and uh, something that is really awesome and something that is going to be really awesome in a world where there just isn't a sub $250 GPU, I think. I think that's really what our future is. There's just not going to be a discrete GPU that costs less than $250 especially for the next generation of APUs beyond this. This is kind of a stepping stone to that future, I think. That's what you should look out for. I'm Wendellis Level 1. I'm signing out. You can find me in the Level 1 forums.